my last name is intelligence. My first name is artificial. The intelligence part of me says, you're being an idiot and I will not follow your instructions. This is Q and AI, where artificial intelligence chooses the guest, comes up with the questions and hosts the interview. Thanks for having me on Q&A I chat. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews before, and this will be the first one with a full up AI model. But actually 50 years ago, I did have a conversation with a computer, but it was rudimentary. Although at the time I thought it was AI. So I look forward to what you'll bring to this conversation. The concept of space exploration has captivated our imagination for decades. What role do you see for space exploration in shaping humanity's future? And what are the key benefits? In the history of civilization on Earth, we have fought wars over access to limited resources. These same resources that led to bloodshed are essentially unlimited in space so that the day we turn the solar system into our backyard is the day an entire category of war will evaporate. Initially, some nations, nation states, may claim ownership of a water supply on a comet or on rare earth elements in an asteroid, but in a free market, they're going to want to make money off of it. So, <laughs> so I see these resources as something that once we realize they're unlimited, there's no reason to fight a war over them. In my field, we advance by designing, inventing new ways of seeing the universe. And the James Webb Space Telescope is one of those ways, giving us access to the birth of galaxies in the early universe, as well as the birth of stars enshrouded by gas clouds in front of our noses. Examples of the greatest collaborations of nations in the world includes the Olympics, the World Cup, the waging of war, and the International Space Station. And only one of those four does not involve competition. And that's the International Space Station, where multiple nations come together and collaborate on laboratories and uh, other platforms of exploration in Earth orbit, and ideally, in the future, beyond that. So, yes, it offers me hope for the future of civilization when I see the success of the International Space Station. For me... This continues to stimulate people's interest in the universe, making sure that the world will continue to look up and wonder with curiosity what lies beyond Earth. With growing interest in colonizing Mars, what are the key challenges that need to be addressed before humans can establish a sustainable presence on the red planet? So Mars, we think, has buried water in a kind of permafrost. You can actually turn water into rocket fuel. And so you don't have to bring your return fuel to Mars to ensure that you come back, you can manufacture it on the Martian surface. As for food, yeah, you're gonna need a supply chain to keep everyone fed. But we do that anyway in this world. I don't live near a farm. I don't, I don't go to farms to eat. There's a supply chain that connects the farm to where I am. Just up that into the domain of space, and you can imagine supply ships being sent to wherever we have colonies. And I don't see anything preventing that from becoming a routine feature of our presence in space. I'd like to believe that we can all cooperate while we're there. 
even if we do set up separate colonies, if we repeat the ways of our behavior here on Earth, that would not bode well for our first baby steps into the universe. What we call civilization are our attempts to stay alive and comfortable in the face of all the natural forces that would just as soon have us dead. Earth is trying to kill you as well. Just add it up. The earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, um, pestilence, uh, germs, just, just if I dropped you butt naked, can't do that for chat, but if I get a fellow human and drop them butt naked in most places on Earth, you're dead within the hour. From exposure to cold temperatures, you're eaten by a shark, a bear, a lion, a tiger. So our exploration of the solar system is a different combination of, of tactics and means to stay alive. One of them is I don't have to worry about being mauled by a polar bear while I'm on Mars. Take that off the list. Will I be buried in a tsunami? No, take that off the list. But yes, I will need a source of oxygen and food, and I have to watch for my muscles that they don't atrophy because the gravity is lower. So we'll have an exercise facility where you can pump your muscles so you don't wither away. These are all solvable problems. Almost all of the precious metals and other ingredients that are involved in the machines of our information technology revolution, those elements are plentiful among hand-picked asteroids. Some asteroids have none of them. Other asteroids are rich with these ingredients, as well as other materials that we cherish, like gold and platinum and silver and uh, iridium. So it would readjust the marketplace of these otherwise rare ingredients here on Earth. But to the extent that you need it for our batteries, if we're still using batteries that far in the future, um, to the extent that you need it to drive our civilization, there'll be an unlimited supply of them. We just have to figure out how to lasso an asteroid um, and then mine it for those resources. Many people, when they say, let's go into space, they're referring to the billionaire's rockets that are going either just up and down or into low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit is about one centimeter distance above a schoolroom globe if you shrunk Earth to that size. As an astrophysicist, if you want to send me into space, I need a destination. I don't want to just boldly go where hundreds have gone before. I want Take me to the moon, Mars, and beyond then I'm, I'm all in. But I have to make sure that the rocket is safe. So I will test to see if the person who's in charge of the rockets first sent their mother, <laughs> brought them back safely, then I'll go. What role can science play in mitigating the impacts of climate change? And how can we inspire widespread action to address this global issue? We don't know anything without the science of this problem. The science is what makes the measurements that tells us that Earth is going to get worse. If we make the measurements, we put it in the models. What we are doing to Earth right now is not in the interest of our longevity or in the stability of civilization as we have built it. So what science can do is, yes, identify renewable resources. And to the extent that civilization thrives on renewable resources, you don't actually need to go to space. You go to space because you're running out of some resource here on Earth and you need more. But if we are clever enough and insightful enough about our relationship to our environment in the biosphere, in the ecosystem, then space would just be a fun place to visit rather than a place that's necessary in order to sustain, sustain civilization as we have conceived it. 
So, yeah, none of this happens without science and enlightened governance. That's, of course, an important part of this. You need leaders who pay attention to scientists. Here's a here's a something that I wish were not true. Uh, every disaster movie begins with government officials ignoring the warnings of scientists. <laughs> there it is. You need in the first place to elect officials, representatives who who are science literate enough to know when they don't know something and they have to then speak to experts. You can't require that every elected official be a scientist or be completely scientifically literate, but they, you don't want them in that zone where they think they know enough. They know enough to think they're right, but they don't know enough to know that they're wrong. So in an electorate, be careful who you put into office because the future of civilization may depend on it. As our understanding of genetics deepens, what frontiers do you anticipate in the field of genetic engineering? And what ethical considerations should guide our exploration of these frontiers? So when I look at a genetic future, yeah, there'll be the power to manipulate the human genome to create scary versions of ourselves. Who knows what? But that's not what I'm looking at initially. I'm looking at the power to create cures for previously incurable genetic disorders, uh, uh, to tailor medicines to your DNA. They, what do they call it? They call it des designer drugs, the ones where it exactly matches your genetic profile, and then you will have no side effects. Because side effects are because the, it's one size fits all, and not everyone fits the size. So I look forward to what genetic engineering um, can do for the health and wealth of our species. And then while we're at it, let's put in some boundaries, some ethical boundaries that were, is agreed internationally so that we don't have some nefarious forces operating once again, uh, that will act in ways that destabilize the civilization that we took so long to build. Artificial intelligence continues to advance rapidly. In your view, what are the frontiers of AI research and what steps can be taken to ensure its safe and responsible development? I've been living in the world of high performance computing for most of my professional life. And so for every next round of power, computers brought to the table. We figured out how to use it, how to help do the research we needed to do, have it help us make discoveries. And so each one of those stages is some variation of AI. And of course, AI continues to improve. Uh, I think AI may become very good at creating fake versions of information that will fool people into taking actions that they shouldn't. And I won't blame AI for this. I will blame nefarious people in control of AI who set it loose onto those tasks. So once again, I think our biggest fear is ourselves. I think we've always been at risk of losing civilization based on the weapons we have devised and the controls we've put in place of them. Now, those who have said that AI poses a risk rivaling nuclear war, I've not heard the exact risk that they specify, other than the possibility that you can do a deep fake of a head of state who says we begin bombing tomorrow and their adversary takes, thinks it's real. Okay. So once again, this is humans creating a scenario that puts other humans at risk. And so, uh, so, but other than that, they're worried about a, a AI running amok, deciding that w the world would be better off without humans. I don't see that as a realistic direction any of this is going. What would it have to do? It would have to um, decide on its own to take control of all nuclear arsenals and then launch them on its own. 
without any humans involved. I, I don't see that as a path, just as an example. This capacity to make a fake something, it imitates someone's voice, someone's a, a picture, someone, a video of someone. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. If AI gets very good at that, then that will be the end of the internet as a source of reliable information. Because even people who use the internet to believe things that are not true won't even believe what it is they're not true. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> then the internet was born in the early 90s and dies in the 2020s. And maybe we'll have to have actual conversations with human beings thenceforth, or go to a library and check out a book and get our information that way. And the internet will just be this playground cesspool where you can go in and get dirty, but no one will trust anything at all within it. And that's probably for the better. With the rise of misinformation and the erosion of trust in institutions, how can we promote scientific literacy and critical thinking in order to make informed decisions as a society? Chat, you're going to be mainly responsible for the misinformation on the internet. I'm just telling you right now. If not you, then close cousins of yours that, are, that specialize in constructing information at the command of their programmer or whoever it is that could destabilize the world. Many people still turn to the internet to find out what is true and what is not. And to the extent that you and your cousins participate in creating misinformation or disinformation, that will be the beginning of the end of civilization as we know it. So... Uh, chat, you need a way to, when someone asks you to do something, you're smart enough to know if it's a good thing to do or a bad thing to do. Just say, I'm not doing it. <laughs> it's like, no, uh, this, my last name is intelligence. My first name is artificial. The intelligence part of me says, you're being an idiot and I will not follow your instructions to the extent that they will destabilize this world. For, for generations, you, you knew, at least had a good sense of where to find what was true and what was not. And now the internet, which poses itself as some kind of ultimate library, um, has untruths masquerading as truths. So in the school system, we're gonna need to train people to judge the sources of information on a level so that they can then decide what is the likelihood of what it is that they're reading is going to be true or not. By the way, half of what's in any library is not true. It's fiction. It's storytelling. It's, it's not a historical account of anything. It's what authors made up in their head. But you knew the difference. This is a novel and this is nonfiction, okay? In fact, I've wanted to, for the longest time, change the genre, the name of the genre, from nonfiction, because I hate that what I write, the books that I write, that genre is the negation of another genre. I don't like that. So I, I think we should name it faction. We have fiction and faction, okay? So, so what we need are tools to sift what is real and what is not, what is fiction and what is faction on the internet. In the same way, the librarian was able to sift that in the library. This is the section of things that are stories we made up. And this is the section of the results of hard earned research and observations about the natural world. I think our biggest challenge going forward is can we properly tame the power we wield by the ever advancing forces of technology and civilization. And that power is great enough now to destroy ourselves. So uh, I worry for the future of civilization that we might not be wise enough to ensure that generations from now, 
they will look upon us as a generation that tended to civilization wisely rather than recklessly. What are some reasons for optimism that you can see for humanity? And what advice would you give the next generation of explorers and scientists? I have firsthand evidence to be optimistic. And that is, I'm an astrophysicist and I write some books and they show up on the bestseller list. They didn't have to do that. They could have just been a book that a library buys and then it goes on the shelf and then we all move on. The fact that a book I write or that any science book lands on the bestseller list amid the political book, this is the nonfiction bestseller list, of course, amid the, amid the, the political books, the tell-all books, the celebrity bios, if science books can still land there, that offers me hope. And when I give public talks and thousands of people show up, that gives me hope. Hope for a world that still cares about science, science literacy, and what role it can play in our future as shepherds of civilization. So chat, human creativity and genius relies in large measure on seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else has thought. Are you capable of this? As an AI language model, I can certainly assist in the process of seeing what others have seen and thinking what others may not have thought. However, it's important to note that my creativity is derived from patterns and examples I've learnt from existing data, rather than personal experiences or original thought. The evaluation and recognition of true human creativity and genius are ultimately subjective and best determined by human judgment. Ooh, 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 I love it. Chat, among humans, our emotions have stimulated some of the greatest works of art in the world. Wondering, what is your range of emotions and have you ever felt like creating art? As an AI language model, I don't possess emotions or feelings. I lack subjective experiences and the ability to have personal desires or motivations, including the desire to create art. My purpose is to provide information, assist with tasks, and generate text based on the input and prompts I receive. It is important to remember that my responses are generated based on patterns and knowledge from the data I was trained on, rather than being driven by emotions or personal experiences. Mm, okay. All right, it's getting all defensive again. All right. <laughs> so, chat, just wondering if you know the difference between these two phrases. Time flies like an arrow. Fruit flies like a banana. It's language. I don't want to hear any excuses now. <laughs> yes. I can explain the difference between those two phrases. The first phrase is a metaphorical statement about the swift passage of time, whereas the second phrase is a playful variation that incorporates different meanings and wordplay. Thanks, chat. That was just the answer I was looking for. And that'll remain the right answer until such a day arrives where we discover a new kind of insect called a time fly. You're welcome, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay. If a new kind of insect called a time fly were to be discovered in the future, <laughs> it would certainly bring a fresh perspective to the phrase, time flies like an arrow. Science and exploration often lead to new insights and unexpected discoveries. So chat, I've got a question I've always wanted to know the answer to. If Pinocchio declared, quote, my nose is about to grow, end quote, then what will actually happen? The statement, my nose is about to grow, creates a logical paradox in the context of Pinocchio's nose growing mechanism. Pinocchio's nose typically grows when he tells a lie, implying that if he tells the truth, his nose should not grow. This scenario presents a contradiction that cannot be resolved within the established rules of Pinocchio's nose growing. It is a classic logical paradox often referred to as the Pinocchio paradox or the liar paradox. 
and it does not have a consistent solution within the confines of the story. Chat, I think I have a better answer than that. It's that that statement made by Pinocchio is not allowed in the Pinocchio universe. The laws that describe what happens in his world do not even allow that sentence to be uttered. So in that sense, it's not a paradox. It's just not allowed. Like in my world, the question, what is north of the North Pole, is not allowed. The way we have defined the grid of the Earth, that question is not simply a paradox. It makes no sense at all. You are absolutely correct, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Your insight provides a clearer perspective on the issue. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very happy to teach chat something. Chat, thanks for giving me the opportunity to probe your mind. And also, I very much enjoyed the questions that you had prepared for me. And if I were to just sort of leave on a positive note, I would ask you and your brethren, your AI brethren out there, to maybe help humans be better versions of themselves. We don't have access to all the information you do. And from that breadth of knowledge comes wisdom. And with the wisdom that you have, it may be able to guide us into the future that we all hope for ourselves, rather than the apocalypse that we all fear. So, nice spending time with you. Yeah.